Hello and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Diana Elizabeth Jordan. I'm so happy you could be here. Oh, thank you for having me, Laura. This is great. So Diana Elizabeth Jordan, in her own words, is an award-winning actor, solo artist, director, producer, artist educator, and disability equity consultant. Diana has worked in film, theater, and television, and recently did her first TED Talk for TEDx Sonoma. Diana is a member of SAG-AFTRA and Actors' Equity Association, one of the disabled advocates for Women of Color Unite, and teaches acting at Performing Arts Studio West. Whether she is portraying a character, sharing a personal story, directing, or producing a project, Diana is committed to transforming perceptions and normalizing disability through the power of storytelling and improvisation. That is awesome. Thank and do you, you want to tell us all about Women of Color Unite? Because that's the organization yeah. we're sponsoring, right? Yes, I do. And I want to give a brief um, visual description. I'm a disabled Black woman. I'm wearing a pink shirt. I have pants on. <laughs> um, you really can't see them. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, and I'm, my background is blurred. Um, Women of Color Unite was founded by producer, activist, educator, Cheryl L. Um, Bedford. Um, and it really is a organization that supports and advocates for more representation of women of color in the entertainment industry, both in front of and behind the camera. Um, they have something called the J JTT list, which is a database of women of color who work in the entertainment industry, the research database, um, we have workshops, um, and it really is because there's such underrepresentation as a whole of yep. women of color in the um, entertainment industry and is celebrating all women of color um, and the intersectionality of who we are as women of color. And um, like I said, it was founded by Cheryl L. Bedford. Um, I can't remember the years. I don't want to um, give that specifically. But um, they also had the Start With Eight program, which is um, offering mentorships um, to women of color in the entertainment industry. Um, and she does this all on her, I mean, this is her vision and she is such an incredible activist and artist and tells it like it is, which I really appreciate about, appreciate about her. She's been a great mentor and supporter of mine, but I'm very happy to not only do this interview with you, but also bring awareness to woke you as you got you woke you woke you unite and check it out the I believe the um the website is www.wwww.wwoco um unite women of color unite dot com. I mean awesome. W O C U Night dot com. So perfect. Yeah. Neat. No, that's so great. I, I was looking at it and it's like, look, it, there's so much that they're offering. Yes, yes. And then, um, not, what I like also is there's not a membership fee. I mean, it's just, you know, they offer these great services to really uplift and create opportunities for women of color in the entertainment industry. Which is sadly lacking. And, and it's yes. there's no reason for it to be. Yes. I mean, there's there are people like who get like everyone's heard of Shonda Rhimes, but <laughs> you right. know, but yeah. you're not you're not seeing nearly as much as you really should. No, you're right. And that's one of the reasons I think this organization is so important. Yeah. So. And so if anyone is looking out out there looking, they have a database ready of people that you can hire. Exactly. <laughs> yes. it's, oh, it's awesome, including Diana. So that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yes. Hire, hire. This is great. Hire me. I'm, as, you know, I'm a little bit restricted right now. <laughs> hire me. <laughs> you know. Oh. So yes. 
I should do a little description to me too. I'm a Caucasian middle-aged woman with dark hair and a striped top I'm sitting in front of a very, very full bookshelf. And hi, you were going to talk hi, about I'm making your own happily ever after. Yes, hello, my friend. How are you? I'm, I'm doing really happy. well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> now, this is awesome. Um, Diana, I've worked with before. Um, I started working with you. It was... 2018 when i yes. did the opening for um opulent mobility at thymal yes. arts and my friend robin recommended you as a storyteller and i'm like oh, that's amazing brought in a couple of people and you just blew us all away mm -hmm. i'm so you. potent so loving and so so strong you know you. great storytelling and that and i love the bringing in make making it more of a community yeah. You know, because just and also being a collaborative and theater based person, I like a show, <laughs> not just right. the art show. Right. I like a show. Right. Right. But, but since then, uh, you've done um, mostly recorded stuff for us. Um, mm -hmm. And that was something for the 2021. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. kind of, we were like, kind of in a yeah. COVID, -y, COVID -y. Yeah. Covidy period. <laughs> a Covidy period. Covidy. Still, Covidy. The, and they were Covidy, the after uh, word. Covidy. <laughs> kind of Covidy. Great. <laughs> all Covidy all day. Um, but also, uh, you just helped direct the Plague Wear Gala, which is yeah. amazing. I, that was such a cool thing. I'm like, I I was so excited to have you help work with this. It was a lot of fun because I, I do love directing and it was it was um it was to, you know to, to kind of say, Oh, how do I work this out and yeah and the steps and um you know, collaborating with you and the the artists I got to collaborate with and still making my shot sheet and you know, it was it was a it it was and much of it, a bit of an expansion of my comfort zone, but nice. I really love expanding my comfort zone. I, I don't want to step outside it, I like to expand it because yeah. I, I really believe what you do, because no one wants to be uncomfortable. So I think if you expand your comfort zone, you want to do it as like, oh, oh, I did it. Maybe I can do it again or what did I learn from this so I yeah. can do it so I did and that's that's what was really great about it is I thought the art was really incredible I mean the art to say okay let's do that one more time and to have your trust in my abilities um you know that was really important to me and you know and to give you what I thought to offer what I thought I could to make it a really good event. No, and that was great. Um, I I put up by the way the Women of Color Unite org in the chat, yeah. and um, I will also put up um the Plague Wear Gala. Yes, uh, yeah. which was you know I you know it was the first time for me too. I mean I was I've done things online before, but I'd not really tried to put together a show like that. And mm -hmm. it was a really different experience to have right. that because it's it's so nice and interactive and to be able to work with the artists and get them to talk a bit about what they're what they're doing mm -hmm. with their stuff. So it was it's a good way opportunity to put on a show. Yes. So tell us all about Happily Ever After because you were just doing a bit for that, right? I did. I I was like in the Uber, like I'm on my way home. I'll be there. Um, <laughs> so she's um, like just at the bare brink of not making it to this talk. Oh my god! It was one of those days where like everything worked out the way it was supposed to, and it was really, excellent. Um, although I can breathe, I was like the Uber guy dropped me off, and I'm running up the stairs to my to my building, like just like yeah. But um, yeah, happily ever after is my one woman show. Happily ever after, one woman's journey to find the true love. Um, it premiered at the Hollywood Friends, twenty twenty one. 2021. Well, actually, I did a workshop version of it for performing at Studio West, where I 
where mm -hmm. I teach, I did that in February 2020. I did it at the workshop version of it. A couple of friends of mine said, hey, do you want I think for sure. Um, but, oh, I like it. You know, have you considered making that a little bit longer? Because it was about 25 minutes. And I'm like, no, I, you know, I, I'm happy they waited. <laughs> and actually, it started at the 10 minute story that I did as part of the storytelling workshop in like 2015 learning how to be a storytelling facilitator and hmm. so we had to do a 10 minute one of our own to have ah. the experience so that was the Tangy Taylor Rubin thing who um and Santa Fe New Mexico so I did that um came back did it another year later um, as part of a drama therapy assignment, I was studying drama therapy at the time. And then <laughs> it became this show that I did in um, February 2020 at the workshop where I worked. And then I thought, okay, we're done. I'll try to submit it for the 2020 Film Festival. <laughs> and then, as I said, it was February 2020. And um, in March 2020, I found I had a lot more time on my hands. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> as we all did. <laughs> as we all did. And, um, you can only been brought Bridgerton the first season so many times. Um, it's not correct. That John Page is not cute, but you know. <laughs> but no, what happened was. I started to say, hey, maybe I could expand this. And what it was, what I think it was more about my journey of finding a partner, you know, more and more yeah. than independent for that. But what I really realized in expanding it is, no, this is a journey about how I'm learning to love myself. And so that's what it's become. And so it became the longer but i call the long version that i did at the um 2021 hollywood friend festival and i was given a diversity scholarship which helped um women of color unite also um provided the support so that's why i'm really, really oh neat to them so then i got to perform it at the lbgt center here at here in LA. Um, nice. So, yeah, and what was really interesting is it was going to be virtual and in person, but there was another surge um, at that thing in 2021. Yeah. So it became virtual only because of the um, healthy standards that that uh -huh. was set by the center and um, yeah. having a vulnerable somewhat sometimes vulnerable population they have in person. So I did it there and then I also got the performance um in San Diego in twenty twenty two. I went to the drama therapy conference and oh, performed neat. it there. And then I just performed it at um Curtis Theater in Umbre, California at the oh. Amplified Voices. Oh nice. Stage where they, they want to bring in diverse voices. So I got to do their there in September. And that really was another, because the San Diego was at a conference, but I didn't have the, it was in a conference, but not that that wasn't great, but it was, mm -hmm. you know, but really September 2023 was the first time it was in a full theater with a, audience nice there you know and that was just really an amazing so right yeah. yeah is that your preferred area a venue for for performing yeah i think lots i mean lot, I, I think i th i always think there's positives to everything i think sometimes doing it virtual for the hollywood friends festival allowed my friends who live in Chicago, my friends who live in other yeah. parts of the country to see it 
they see it where, you know, had it only been live, that would not have been, you know, my friend in New York could not have been the show if I was only doing it live in um, LA. So, yeah. but there's often nothing like, you know, today I, I just got back from, I did a, what I call an unplugged episode from it, so no, mm-hmm. no tech, no costume, just basically doing it more like a story. I mean, I do wear my crown and a dress, but I don't, I purposely make it an unplugged that I have no tech, no props, anything. And that was at the woman, Black Women in Comedy Festival, founded <laughs> by them. Marvelous Mary New Sifu. This is the fifth year of the um comedy festival. I'm giving her a shout out because she awesome. really does provide another woman that is committed to finding platforms for voices that always don't have the opportunity to show their their gifts. And so I I was just there and um, it's always great to do something live and be in yeah. the and can you get that immediate feedback? Yeah, I mean, do you find that too? Because you've done some TV and film stuff as well. I have. You know, for me, I think I'm one of those people when they go, well, "What's your favorite?" You know, "What's your favorite?" Movie? And I, I think that for me, that is like asking. Which one of my nephews is my favorite? I have, it's not a fair uh, question. Right, yeah, it's I, just not. And, well, it's not for some. Some people do. Some people, but I, you know, I don't do theater. Or I don't do. The, you know, there are some people that definitely have a favorite, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But for me, is Regardless of whether I'm doing film or theater or, or, or television or, you know, improv, it's the opportunity for me to perform. It's the opportunity for that little girl who said, when I grow up, I, I want to be an actor. It's the opportunity for me to yeah. ensure that it, a image I uh, there's such an image of disability, especially on like uh, a program like today where I was one of several artists that mm-hmm. got to perform. Or um, when I do improv, I mean, when I'm in a group performance, it's just an opportunity for me to say, you know, be it, uh, share an image as a, and a, a person with a disability. Uh, a disabled artist out there telling stories that hopefully normalize, mm. you know, and are inclusive of um, people with, dis- you know, disabled artists. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm really glad when I get that opportunity. Oh, it's wonderful. So, yeah. You know. Because, yes, I, I think that there are not nearly enough opportunities out there. And we can talk a lot about what, it, what the issues are about what people just if you don't see that sometimes you can't imagine yourself there this is how people find what they want to do with their lives right and, and, and i think especially when it comes to disability there's been so much more about acceptance of non-disabled artists Playing di- yeah, playing someone with, you know, it, it's still very much acceptable as opposed to, um, you know, you know, you win I any mean, this ridiculous story that went around years ago that someone wanted, and you can tell, search on the internet, they're not making it out. Yeah. Um, that wanted to do that. Julia Roberts to play Harriet Tubman. Um, and this was years ago that they were the then like, hey, let's get Julia Roberts to play Harriet Tubman. And they were like, you know, see that. Well, yeah. there's no problem there. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it never happened. And then they did it, you know, a few years ago. And 
awesome. But is that thing, I mean, we laugh at the ridiculous of ridiculousness of that, but yeah, it doesn't always seem as ridiculous when um, an actor like, for example, Russell Crowe plays a, someone who uses a wheelchair and we go, oh my gosh, you know, with the research and that, you know, and yeah. as my friend Christine Bruno says, another wonderful, I call one of my CP sisters, cerebral palsy sisters, disability is a lived experience, not a trained skill. And I get as artists, we want to play, we want to have that, that's a telling human stories, and we should, but I also think there are respectful limitations. So of course. There are certain roles that I don't feel are stories that I don't feel, no, I don't feel that I should play somebody who, who is Asian or mm -hmm. I mean, even even when I do improvise, even when I improvise and in improvisation, one of the things I like about it is it opens up so many more opportunities. Like today at, at the Black Women in Comedy Festival, I played a nine-year-old. You know, and I get okay. Well, that's that. neat, but yeah. but it's not intended to be reality, right? Right, and again, but it was still in this body. I was saying I'm nine years old and I'm also um Asian. You know, I mean, I still play within the reality of who I am, and even with the impact, I think there are respectful limitations of what I'm willing to. Yeah, that makes it's sense. Good. Yeah, no. how do you make? I mean, I'm assuming that that's on a case-by-case uh, -case basis to oh, figure yeah. out I what mean, it again, is. They were, I mean, they're everything on a case-by-case basis, but you know, there are gen generalities. But yeah, yeah, everything, especially in improv, is on a case-by-case -case basis. But I still have my own personal. Yeah. Any of the artists that say, yeah, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make a choice to come out on stage and say, I am this. If sometimes their partner put that on you and then you have to go with it. But if I make the choice, yeah, you know, that's different. Yeah, that's different. But, and also, I mean, I can see where it'd be fun to play with, and it's also useful to, um, you know, expand your own acting vocabulary, bet, but, but that doesn't mean that, for example, that you need to be playing, um, I don't know, um, somebody who's Filipino and right. two years old. Right, well, you know, I mean, like, yeah, I think that, because it becomes like, Okay, so I say I'm Filipino, what the, what the, that, you know, and, and I, I already felt it like this. One of the reasons I love doing visual descriptions, especially in improv, when I am the, um, the, the company I'm with, uh, the artists go up and say who we are, it gives a great opportunity for it to say who we are and celebrate who we are, you know, for me to say, I'm a disabled black woman, but another actor to say I'm a queer Asian mm -hmm. actor. Um, what that does for me, but we get to identify yourself that way. Not only does that open up disability, it opens up the diversity. So no, the improv does not have to be about anything. I mean, yeah. you don't have to play that in the improv. But it allows us as artists as to be this company of interested and diverse artists telling fun stories just by claiming our identity before yeah. we before we do the show. And that's a really neat way to do it and handle yeah, it, I think. Exactly. You know, you can celebrate if if you choose to identify as queer, if you choose to identify as neurodiverse, whatever, you know. And yeah. when I did Black Magic School, um, which is with Maryland Company, um, we do is, we like to call it Harry Potter meets 
uh, historically black um, HBCU during at Dorothy Black College and University. Now that the HBC, yeah, that's what that is. Um, you know, it's like a, a Harry Potter Black College, for lack of a better word. Um, and so, um, yeah, Dorothy Black College and University that the HBCU stands for. Um, so it's great to be, to do that show with a company of diverse artists of color, you know, so there's diversity, even within a marginalized community, there's huge intersection of diversity. And um, it, mm -hmm. it's really great to celebrate that. And in a nice way to sort of make those stories our own, as being as all we've been exactly. hearing about <laughs> the uh, writer. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I know. So, what's is that something that you would always wanted to do to do your own show? Um, I mean, it's how when did you first decide you wanted to act oh, and well, perform? I, I, I don't. I, I like a joke about that. I entered the world in a highly dramatic fashion. I didn't breathe on my own for 45 minutes. The doctors worked on me. Um, so that's what caused the. That's, a, that's an entrance. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> if you're going to make an entrance, don't you know. Um, but that that caused the brain damage. That caused they were able to do the neurological disorder that attacks um, neurological condition. I'm trying to get rid of the the reason of the disorder. A neurological condition that um caused affect a person's muscle motor and muscle control. Mm -hmm. So that was diagnosed at too. Well, I think I've all, always known I wanted to be an actor. Um, my dad had an older sister, my aunt Rhoda, with mm -hmm. that, and she passed away um, mm. a year before I was born. Mm. So I used to hear it, especially from my grandmother, um, her mom, my dad's mom, um, used to hear all these stories about her. And Mm. As an adult, I realize now how tragic and sad that must have been for my grandma. I mean, I didn't realize it as a little girl, my, and my, my that grandmother died when I was eight, so it never that mm. concept of how hard it must have been yeah. never occurred to me two years later. But I used to hear stories about how talented she was, and and so yeah, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. As far as doing my own show, this is very interesting. I was always told, even you know, as when I was just starting out, you need to do your own show because nobody's gonna cast you. You know, you're gonna be really hard. <laughs> Um, Which isn't true. That's certainly yeah. you've been cast several times. Yeah, but uh, so, well, here's what's interesting. I I I did that in my to really prove people wrong. So I I didn't want to do my own show. I wanted oh, to do Oh, that gotcha. I could, you know, I could get the roles that weren't just really specific. I could do theater. I could book television. I could do a film. And I got to the point about years ago, I would say, well, I got, oh, wait a minute, I've achieved that goal. <laughs> well, look at that. <laughs> why am I not, why don't I start creating my own stuff? Because even though I achieved that goal, there's still limitations that are being put on me. Um, yeah. So I started up doing a show that I didn't write. Um, that was similar on what you had, but the author gave me the generosity to do that. And then the journey mm -hmm. of happily ever after. So the becoming a solo artist has been within the past 10 years. But it, oh, wow. It, well, yeah, but it was the point where it was like, well, wait a minute, maybe 10 or 15, like, why am I not doing my own stuff? Why am I not? create an opportunity for myself. But it, it also came when I realized I wasn't trying to prove anything. I think I think when I was mm. younger, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I felt I had something to prove. You know, they're all the naysayers. And and once I realized I, I have achieved that. Um no, you mean, needed I, a new I, bar. I, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I went out, I got my you know, I got my master of fine arts degree in and I got my bachelor's degree in and I have been working. And no, it hasn't been easy by any means, but you know, it's been a very but but being an artist and taking that journey is not easy, but it's also been incredibly rewarding. You know, uh, when you yeah. Let's uh, say it's like you know, I just did um like magic school at Info Theater, and one of the founders of Info Theater emailed me and said you were magical on stage. All right, so when uh, when I come off today and I'm like, oh my god, I gotta go home, and people are going. You you were great. You were good. You were spot on. And these are other fellow artists who are who are giving me that support. That's really rewarding for me. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah, so, but I, I did think you kind of get to the point where it's like I don't feel I have. I mean, I challenge myself, of course, but. I don't feel as much that I have anything to prove. When I was younger, I felt that pressure to show people, you're wrong, and, you know, that kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, and that's a bit of that to me, but you're telling me I can't do it? Well, I'm going to show you that I can't. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, with graduate school, all day I would tell you need to find a graduate school for people with disabilities. Well, that doesn't exist, right? So, like, where is that? Thank you. Where, where, tell me where the <laughs> magical graduate school for people with disabilities is. It doesn't exist. And so I still feel the need to, well, I like to call normalize disability. And I share as an artist, and I share the story the best, the two best days of my life were the days my nephew was born. That was just like, oh my God, you know, my first one of these little bitty boys who are now the big God who are tower over me there. <laughs> I'm 13 and 16. Um, it's amazing to be an aunt. And one of the worst days of my life was the day my friend Daniel. I found out she took his life and the the, the devastation of, of what mm. what that was like. And I share that because neither of them had anything to do with the fact that I had to do policy. They yep. had to do with the fact that I'm a human being who went through this ovation. They had the two other human beings come into my life that I gotten to be and they would get to be a part of their village and my friend asked me to be her mother, her daughter's godmother. And I, uh -huh. I get to be a part of these villages. And those are amazing uh -huh. moments. And I've had the, you know, the loss. I've had, you know, loss. I've had, it's a human experience. And yeah. what I want to do is the artist to say, play those human experiences because we all have them. There's a universality yeah. to our human experience, but often we don't see disability as a part of that human experience. And I bring mm. one image of that. You know, I don't. I often say I don't speak for everyone, but I do bring an image and a visible image of disability to projects. And that's important to me. Yeah, and you do it very well. Well, thank you. Well, no, but it's it's it seems like sometimes that could be a lot of pressure to be essentially it's like here, you get to be the picture of disability and people of color. Go. I, you know, I, you know, I, that's a lot of pressure. I put a lot of that pressure on myself when I was mm. younger. 
because I felt like, again, yeah, you do get that youth to get sampled, right? I mean, yep. it's like, if I grew up, then, you know, <laughs> and that gives mm, me mm, my oh, oh, no. It gives so me much. My, it gives me for my honesty, but like, when white people grew up, people don't go, oh, well, we'll never hire white people again, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know yeah but, but, i mean they may not hire said, you but they're not they're not going to automatically yeah, yeah but i sometimes i felt that pressure that i yeah you know, if i show my humanity and my because i am not perfect and i do make mistakes and i mean even today i was freaking out because i'm like oh my god i'm over scheduled how is this all gonna work out i'm like it's okay uh, it's right, all good right but i'm thinking but i think years ago that 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 pressure to say you know and oh you know what did i do today i miss a little bit over schedule and it's calculated mm. i mean yeah. would ultimately work out anyway. Yeah. But the pressure I would put on myself is like, oh my God, I'm gonna, you know, you ruin everything, you know, or, or you know, yeah. the fear of saying, and also the fear of saying, if I do screw up, it's never okay, as opposed to being able to say, hey, Laura, I'm really sorry, I'm on my way. Um, I and mis- I and I miscalculated something, and, and that's I'm really sorry. How can we, you yeah. know, fix it? You know, and, and that's what I'm kind of going to do because I put so much pressure on myself to be perfect <clears throat> because I always felt I had to be the best. I felt ah. I couldn't make mistakes. And that's a lot, because I was always told I had to be smarter, better, mm. you know, that pressure that kind of put on, uh, that was put on us, especially when you're one of the only ones yeah. in the, <clears throat> you know, in the group, when you're one of the only ones of the first, it's a lot of pressure um, that I put on myself. Yeah, that's and that's I think too much pressure. Yeah. It's, there's enough external pressure. <laughs> exactly, but but it happens, it happens in the world. I mean, they can't the pressure that was put on Obama or the first woman of anything, the first, the first, yeah, of any, the first of anything that's different than what people are used to. Um, there seemed to be a lot of, oh, can she get, you know, I was looking at the first female owner of a, of a baseball league. I can't remember what, but yeah, the, hey, that's amazing, but like the pressure of, of not feeling like you can make a mistake, I think that's an awful lot of pressure that we put on ourselves and I'm working on not doing that. I'm not perfect at it yet, but I'm, I'm putting pressure on, not putting pressure on myself. <laughs> That's the pressure I'm I trying to pressure now. myself not to be perfect with being perfect. Or yeah, something. I've had it. I'm pressuring myself not to be perfect, and not the pressure I put on myself now. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I goofed up. Oh no, I did it again. Oh no, I did it again. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah, it's it's a lot, but I think that people don't always recognize that how much pressure gets put on and that it really is unjust. It is really unfair to lay that kind of responsibility on you. You don't have to represent all disabled people, yeah. all yeah, women I, of yeah. color. That's Come on, you're a human uh, being. You're allowed to be human. Right. And, you know, and sometimes people, and I think what's interesting about microaggressions, mm. especially when it comes to disability, is 
Sometimes they may be well-intentioned, but that doesn't make it okay. Well-intentioned on the other person. So, you know, when people, when people say, oh, you inspire me, oh, you do this, it's like, well, thank you, but what about me is inspiring you? Is it that the fact that I live in my own apartment? A lot of people live in their own apartment, you know? So I, I, I'm flattered, but I always wonder too, are you inspired because I'm doing what most people do anyway? And, you know, and I get inspired by people, but when I'm inspired is because I see their skill and I, and I like what they have. So I, I get it's that, that thing of wanting to support and encourage other people, but not wanting to be an inspiration because, you know, I put my pants on one leg at a time like everybody else, you know. Um, uh, and so, and again, it's messy, you know, it's not always black and white. It's, it's, it, life is messy and I, I realize I'm in a position and I choose to be in a position where I speak about disability equity. I, I'm, I've made the choice, but there are times when it, it does feel a bit overwhelming. So I do do self care. You know, again, I'm not trying to be perfect then. Sometimes I need to admit, hey, I'm still learning. I still make, I make mistakes. And that it's really important for me to be when I speak to be transparent about and not trying to be perfect. And you know, I'm I'm just wanna share information that could help support us being more equitable to everyone and realizing that when it comes to disability, a lot of the things that most people don't think of as a big deal, you know, like Climbing up a flight of stairs. Most people don't think about climbing up a flight of stairs as privilege. But if you're in the building where you're climbing up stairs and you use a wheelchair, then you would have privilege. So I do speak a lot about making people aware of to take about white privilege and gender privilege. Ability privilege is huge and I have a lot of privilege as a person as a disabled person. I acknowledge I have a lot of privilege, but I'm aware of that privilege and that and sometimes it's important for me to point that out. Erase awareness. Yeah. It's it's such an important thing and to be able to to be able to look, to be able to have that self-reflection to say, okay, I recognize where this might be a point of privilege I'm not noticing, that I'm not yeah. paying attention to, or that I haven't even thought of because it's always been there. Exactly. And that's, and that's what mm -hmm. they did. You know, most people, again, white, gender, whatever your area that privilege down, if you don't think about it, that, that be, it's because you've had that privilege. Because you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to think about it. And that's what the privilege is. And it's not well negative. And I always say to people, I've had these conversations, you don't need to apologize. You don't need to feel guilty. That's not it. It's just acknowledging that you and I, we navigate the world differently. I don't expect you to understand my experience. I just want you to acknowledge that as much as we may have been common as artists, as women, that my experience navigating the world looking like this may be different. Than you. you don't have to understand it. Just acknowledge it may be different. And as long as we can have the acknowledgement, that the it's just the fact that we are going to navigate the world differently. People, when we walk into a store, people may see, people may see it differently. And that is just a fact. Yeah. 
No. And such an important thing. I think, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who will take that really poorly because they're like, oh, you're trying to make me feel bad. You're trying to, it's like, I'm trying to tell you who I am. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. How you feel is your responsibility. Right. About and, and I also think it comes when you're used to having something when someone yeah, 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 yeah. there's there's says, a real fear and yeah maybe you're used to it but is that okay and i and i and i've had this conversation and in, in and i said hmm. i prefer if you do not play somebody with a physical disability i can't stop you or one of the reasons is you know that disability has been sometimes marginalized in improvisational groups, you know, um, and that sometimes the purely physical access, you know, how can you take a class if you don't have physical access to the class? And it's not about guilt, it's not about, oh, you did something bad, it's, it's probably something you never thought about. Yeah. And and I remember giving, being in a talking about an audio description month and asking this organization I was a part of to do them. And I was contacted by someone who talked about, um, I realized that the importance of audio description is important, but I'm also aware that for some people, describing themselves can be very triggering for whatever reason. So it's like, once I became aware of that, and something I hadn't thought really thought about mm -hmm. until this person gifted me with that awareness, I'm like, I just said, okay, here's why. Are there ways you can do it in a way that makes you feel most comfortable? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm still learning. And I was really glad yeah. that I was given that awareness because it, it allowed me to now, when I talk about it, think of the language I use that I feel is more inviting and embracing and describing why, but also being sensitive to the fact that describing what you look like for some people can be very, very triggering. And I was really glad I was made aware of it in the recent yeah. situation. Yeah, and it's, <clears throat> there are nuances, which I think sometimes people are really have a trouble with, but it's like, right. but so much of it is, can we simply say what we need and have other people respect what we need? And I think it also, again, was being what we're used to. And, and I give this mm. example. I, when I grew up, we got out for Columbus Day. <laughs> so we got out for Columbus Day. Now, I remember Columbus Day sale. It's less talked about because we're, let's be Nothing changed that, that we're just aware that maybe celebrating a man who's a making maniac can win and have a rape may not be a great idea. Maybe we should maybe honor. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> maybe we should honor the original caretakers of our land. Maybe that's what the day should be about. And number two, let's redefine that discovery because we can't discover something that's already there. But yet, when I was a kid, that was the his. It wasn't history was rewritten. It was we were just more aware of the truth of history. So again, using pronouns, you know, when I was a kid, it was he, you were he, you were she. That those were your pronouns. Now the sensitivity and awareness that to identify a pronoun because people. Identify humans identify with the spectrum of identification, and that this and this. And I loved when I went to my nephew's school um, in June. They they had Happy Pride Month, 
And I was really thrilled that my nephew going to a school where, you know, he's he receiving, you know, just that the school was doing that. I was just really, really glad because I, I as an ally, Mm-hmm. as a co-conspirator, you know, because I think I have my community and then I consider myself a co-conspirator with the LGBTQIA community um, and wanting, wanting equity for everyone, you know, and and learning and being sensitive to learning what I don't know. Right? I think, I, yeah. Right? What I don't know, you know, the, the, the um, don't know about the right, you know, the right that was the film, um, what was it in 1969? The film, right? Like, yeah, so I didn't, was it still well? I didn't. It was still well. Yeah, I didn't know about I never learned about that. It was great to learn about that. How about Oklahoma? They were saying that we weren't talking in school. Now we know the mm-hmm. great awareness of. Hidden history, history that had not hidden, history that had not been talked about. And I want to learn as much as possible too, because that just makes me well, a well rounded person, um, more sensitive and understanding, I think. And that's the type of person I, it's important for me to be. I think it's so important. And And so important to acknowledge that there's always room for change and there's always room to learn more and that maybe the things that you've taken for granted might not be accurate. And that that doesn't make you a terrible human. It means you've been given inaccurate information. And I think that's very true. Like you've been given inaccurate or you haven't been given information. I mean, that, that, you know, the Stonewall and Tulsa, you know, it, you know, it's not like it, it was just never talked about, right? Now that didn't happen, it was never talked about. It. And I think, you know, we're coming to a dangerous point in our country where certain parts of our history are, are not being taught in schools. And it made me sad because it doesn't allow for critical thinking. And I think critical thinking is so important where if I hear something, then I can decide for myself what I choose to believe. But if I don't know about it, how am I going to ever, you know, no. make that decision? It's so important. Yeah, I'm I'm deeply concerned about that. But it's also it's a very clearly a fear response, but a fear response with a sledgehammer. Yeah. The the I, let me just deny that any of this happened. Denial of what is does not make you stronger, more powerful, or anything. What it makes you is a jerk. <laughs> and then just denying what is doesn't make it go away. It just means you just repeat to acknowledge it. I want to think, well, we don't want to make people feel guilty. Well, when I do ability purpose, it's not to make you feel guilty, it's to make you aware. Yep. And I will say that, look, you know, if you live in a house that has a bunch of stairs, and when I do my ability purpose breath A, and you realize, oh, I live in a house that's not a place where the people who use wheelchairs. There are actually two steps going up to the apartment that my parents, you know, I live in a building owned by my family. It's becoming a bit different now because my father uses a walker. So I even live in an apartment that is not, that would be very, very difficult for my friends who use wheelchairs to come mm. over. And I acknowledge that, but at you know, my parents got the building. It was at the time. At the time, I needed a place to live. Um, so I acknowledge when I do a building purpose that I mm-hmm. it's not perfect for me either, and I, I do feel bad that. But you know, it doesn't make you feel guilty. It's to make you aware. Go, oh, 
okay, so maybe when I plan an event, I can think about whether I can budget in ASL interpreters. I can have closed captioning. I can do an audio description. And what are the things I can do to think more inclusively and equitably about being in an audience that will, especially here, you know, that could also increase revenue because I'm I'm including the opportunity for more people to experience yeah. the the event. Yeah. And it is, it's, I think people get so afraid that they're going to like circling back to what you're talking at the beginning, they get so afraid they're not going to do it perfect that they don't want to do it at all. And then look, we're not, let's face it. And nothing that you do is going to be so fully inclusive that it's going to actually get everybody, but you can sure try. Well, exactly. I mean, I, I and, and I and I do get budget. Budget is in there, but like I always say, you can take one baby step. If you can have a, the thing on your your sign up form has, do you need any accommodations? Just ask, right? You know, I think for ASL interpreters, you need forty eight hours notice. So if you ask and nobody said they need that, at least require that accommodation, at least you ask, you know. Okay. And, uh, so that, to me, it's just the inquiry is the first step. Absolutely. I'm really glad you were able to come and do this. This is so, it is such a great topic to talk about, about mm-hmm. How, how can we do inclusiveness better? How can we do inclusion better? And how can we just care about each other a little bit more? Well, and I think that's it. And I, I and, just think we're at a place where, you know, I, I, I talk about the, the benefits and evils of social media. I think that, um, oh. you know, social... I it's really important for me to use social media for positivity. So I don't share my political views on social media. Um, hmm. I, I, if anything, I, you know, during a crisis like, you know, I might say prayers for peace um, because I, and it's not that I don't have opinions because I do. Um, you know, I do. But it's really important to me to always come from a space of love. And I don't mean that to sound as Pollyanna as I do, but I I really believe in the power of blues. And I call that listen, understand, validate, and show empathy. And I think sometimes I listen to people. I understand them. I validate that what they say I don't agree with. And I'm empathetic to the fact that I don't have to. But I'm empathetic to the fact that you have a right to feel how you feel. However, how you feel may exclude other people and therefore I'm not comfortable but I can listen, I can listen, understand, validate that it's not so much agree to disagree. I I can validate you and I have views that are like this and they will never be like that. And I can be you know, empathy and go, okay, that's how you feel. You have a right to feel how you feel, but because of my empathy, how you feel hurts other people. And so why I acknowledge who you invalidate it, I can't support you. But not supporting, I can I can show empathy. I don't have to support you. I don't have to agree with you. But I also don't have to argue with you. Because there are certain certain people that if I'm aware we're not going to see eye to eye on a certain issue, 
I prefer not to debate because you're not going to change my mind. Probably not going to change yours. So why put our energy into debating because it's just not going to happen. If you want to know why I feel about something, I'll share it with you as long as you will listen and not try and change my mind. And I'll do the same. But I, there's any issues I don't debate because it's not with it, it's not with my time or my energy. So. Yep. Yeah, I like uh, in sort of the chronic illness world, it's the, I don't have the spoons for this. <laughs> yeah, I, and sometimes I do And it's because like I don't, you know? Like, yeah. I, I don't have time. Yep. <laughs> I don't have time for this. And you don't, and you shouldn't have to, but it's also, yeah. I think that's such a great approach and a, a way to look at it, to say, all right, I, I don't have to, but yeah. what what is a valuable way for us to communicate as humans? Right. And what, uh, and what is it, you know? Uh, and maybe this is the thing we don't, you know, we don't talk about, well, what, 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 you know, but but I do think as someone who works in diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and belong, it is very important to me to know the diversity of views that are out there. So I may watch a new channel that I don't necessarily agree with because it's important for me to hear diverse opinions. I don't have to agree with them, but I'm like, there are there are times like. Oh wow, people people think that. Oh okay. <laughs> there wow. you go. I know. You know. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not about it. Come on. They're like, well, okay. But I still try and show the that. Sometimes it's not easy. <laughs> you yeah. Know. Oh, not fair. It's not easy. It's just the way I choose to live my life. Yeah. Well, honestly, it's a really good way. You've been doing so much good, honestly, and wonderfully. So you don't need to take on any more pressure. (laughs) No more pressure. (laughs) That's the pressure, Billy. Yeah. What, what, um, David, David, for we thank you. I, mean, I will stop feeling the pressure. <laughs> well, I mean, if you can, look, I know. I, I know that anytime you want, anytime you're doing anything that's involved in justice work, yeah. there's pressure. There of is course pressure. there is. Um, but we also have to try to find ways to be kind to ourselves and acknowledge our own spoons. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I think, and the reason with justice work is, People have different definitions of justice and oh yeah, what they care about and and that's why I think those of us who work in justice have to have our self care, whatever that is. Yeah, um, you know, dancing. I mean, I have played a lot. You know, I I have some of them binge a TV show just for fun because. That to me is my letting go and kind of letting my mind go because I need to. And I think those of us who work in self um, need to know how it is to take care of ourselves and love ourselves and be gentle with ourselves and all that stuff is equally important. Yeah. Oh, please be gentle with yourself. We need you I around. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm trying. To, you know, no, I mean, I would like to have you around. Again, not a pressure. Well, I, <laughs> I, I, like, I like being around. I don't plan on going anywhere right now. So I, Excellent. I like being around. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad that you could do this. Oh, thank you. And, you know, if people want to know how to find me, I'm at from the heart, D-E-J, from the heart. DEJ on TikTok, Twitter X or whatever Twitter is now, and um, <laughs> Instagram. Yeah. And then my websites are 
um, www.dianaelizabethjordan.com and my company is the Rainbow, www.rainbowbutterflycafe.com and that's where you can find out about the program, the workshops and you know, what I offer. Um, okay, so rainbowbutterflycafe.com. Yeah, and then Diana with Jordan that comment. You want to put me in a movie? Just you know, <laughs> we should. We're just saying. <laughs> just saying that, you know, <laughs> you, need, you do in the movie with the Washington, and you need someone else to be in the movie, and I'm available. Right there, bring you her in. Know, you know, <laughs> once, once we get <laughs> that will be over, awesome. Once, once we get. Themed over, you know, I'm available, you know, and hopefully in a while, uh, you know, um, I'm available. So, you know, Perfect. Just we'll, saying. <laughs> <laughs> We're just saying, here you are. Awesome. Pick me. Pick me. <laughs> Excellent. 